didn't work. That's it. <laughs> Try aiming next time. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Thing. Tread cautiously.
You call this fine Edir and mead? I call it unfit for pigs. I don't think so. I'm here to stay. Hit you back. someone in my sights. Oh, no. 
I can't get a clean hit. Oh, <sighs> Giving them a fair shot. Quick, toss me something else. Be on the seat. Hit me again, and I'll hit no one knows. One possess the time to collect this many. Fish. I wish I could. Got a way of turning off that storm. Looks unfriendly. Mean spirited, even. Stand on Lost Dukaizo. My parents gave me an earful about the horizon spanning beaches and towers reaching beyond the stars. All I can see is good folk tussling over a wasteland. Time to confront Aethys. 
Hopefully for the last time. You know what you're doing? No time to waste then. I'm about as ready to confront God as I'll ever be. We're doing good work here. Setting foot on Ukaizo is a statement that no one can ignore. Captain, I... I don't know what's gonna happen to us, but... I want you to know... And I'm not scared, and... I'm glad you're here with me. Gods, I hope not. Go give the green boy a piece of your mind. Gilded Vale got its name from the way the wheat fields used to look in the sun. But this place... This place really is gilded. Might as well be a different world. Yeah, seems they had a whole different way of looking at things. I'd say I like this one better, but these great people got a funny way of passing on. They disappear from the world, but leave their problems behind for the rest of us to deal with. I guess maybe that's one good thing that's come out of this. Well, at least for me. I got something to do with my life that doesn't involve hauling or shoveling. I even got a friend or two out of it. The whole world's about to face the biggest test it ever saw. What Aethys is doing, it's gonna change everything. We may not survive. Kith, I mean. God of redemption, trying to redeem the gods. <sighs> what a mess. Five years ago, you controlled the destiny of thousands of souls in Sun and Shadow. But the choice you make today shall define the fate of every living thing in Aeora. I know you will. I know you'll choose wisely. And no matter what happens, it's been an honor journeying with you. We gonna do this or what? We've made it this far, yet we're still alive. Might as well square off with my god before our luck runs dry. Neither did modesty, it seems. Sure do. If Gon wants you dead, I figure he can do it himself. Besides, the part of him that's been stomping through the dead fire didn't much help me at Mogren's teeth. Tell me, Watcher, can there be a god of light and birth if souls themselves can no longer be reborn? Reckon it was. Sure, I did some things I now regret. Gone knows I got plenty of blood on my hands. I thought it'd be different how it turned out, but I couldn't dream of any other way. Now then, shall we go face my god for one last time? Find out what it is we can or can't do in these end times. Whether we're meant to wither or thrive, consider me your second shadow.
machine controlling the storm winds down. The clattering of its machinery settles into a low whir and then, at last, hiccups to a halt. Beyond the tower, the black, roiling clouds of Andra's mortar roll away from the ancient city of Ukaizo, with only a tired sigh of wind to see them off. And on that last breath of wind, comes to you a familiar sound. The ring of a bell. The bell's ringing is soft, not the clangor and torrent you've grown used to. It calls to your soul, and your soul yearns to follow it. Your soul flees from your body and into the beyond, chasing that sound. It leads you at last to Bareth's realm, to that cold platform and room of endless doors. Watcher, your journey nears its conclusion. The pallid knight stands before you, her gaunt face impassive. Free of your duty to me, perhaps. But mine is not the only tie that binds you. You have gathered quite a few since we first spoke. Soon you will confront Aethys for what will likely be the final time. And you will do so as the Herald of Bareth, the only creature on the face of Aora to whom he will listen. Remember that. The pallid knight inclines her head to you, black hair hanging lank in her face. She steps back. If Aethys truly intends to go through with his mad plan to destroy the wheel, a generation's worth of souls will be trapped in the in-between. So many would suffer. How can Aethys be so cruel? He cannot just abandon them. Aethys must help the kids find a quick solution. Abaddon strides forward. Aethys thrust this crisis on the Kith. They did not bring it upon themselves. Their only mistake was entrusting us to watch over them. Who will help them rebuild their world now? Aethys will reveal every secret of the gods. Will Kith be able to change the established order if they have no wonder to inspire them? Aethys must help them resolve this quickly, lest every one of Aeora's few remaining mysteries be laid plain. With the wheel destroyed, Kith will tear themselves apart. It is the gods' duty to prevent that happening, lest they doom us all. And as Kith must be ruled, so too must the gods. I say that if Aethys is so eager to throw down the mantle of power and step aside, I shall take my rightful place as Queen of the Gods again. Kith are strongest when they follow our lead, and we are strongest when we lead in turn. United in purpose with the gods, Kith can accomplish things that without us, they could never have even begun. They must- Kith will not solve Aethys' puzzle on their own. And without an established order to fight against, the bonds that bind them dissolve, and they fight amongst themselves. That confidence is what will save Kith, Watcher. Do Wurdika's firm hand is but the motherly smothering of Helia by another name. Mortals should have no special advantages. Only once Kith have striven to improve themselves through trial will they truly know their measure. Kith must suffer to find their strength if they are to survive the world into which Aethas drags them. Our intervention in your struggle would be a cruelty and counter to our purpose. He Indeed. Kith must discover for themselves what it is they are worth, and of what it is they are capable. What we do for them, they do not learn for themselves. Trial breeds ingenuity. If our work of generations was not in vain, Kith will succeed in spite of Aethys' actions. I have faith in Kith's ability to meet Aethys' challenge. Do not mistake my words for indifference, Watcher. They are born from a fierce belief in your potential, not a refutation of it. You see clearly, at last. Margren is blinded by her affection for mortals. 
She does not see that entropy is the destiny of all things. Kith have had their chance. It is time to let silence reign. As Rimmergon's words fade, the Pallid Knight returns. She no longer towers over you, a giant even among the gods, but meets you at your height. She lets the arms crossed over her chest fall to her sides. She speaks to you openly, plainly, an expression almost like tenderness, turning up the corners of her lips. Well, Watcher, you know where we stand. What do you believe? Yours is not the only life at stake. Like it or not, when you stand before Aethys, you will be the voice of all kith. Try to summon a wit of concern. For them, if not for yourself. Now the time has come for us to part, Watcher. I laid upon you a difficult duty, and I know you desire to be free of it. You will be in time, but not now. You are no stranger to hard choices. You killed Theos, and when his soul was laid bare before you, you chose to return it to the wheel. You made his memory his penance. Remember the strength it took to make that choice, and know that you alone may sway Aethys now. When you stand before him, choose your words carefully. The gods depart one by one in brooding silence. A solitary figure remains perfectly still until the last of her colleagues is out of earshot. Wodica peers down at you, a triumphant grin splitting her weathered features. Gareth is a fool if she thinks I'll let her enjoy the last word. You are trusted with a heavy responsibility, Watcher, speaking for mortals and representing their interests in the future to come. You reminded me why I never depend on the judgment of others. Never did I imagine the dead far of and our greatest achievements falling into the hands of the pirates. And then there's Captain Elvis. Bold, decisive, and unforgiving. A woman after my heart. If more kiss shared her discipline, then the Principe would be entitled to their destiny. This is a stinging indictment of the trading companies in the Hawana, who couldn't even protect the dead fire's most valued asset from a fleet of drunken simpletons. And yet, they have earned your confidence in a gamble that could decide the fate of all mortals. Why is that? Uh-huh. Consider my curiosity appeased. For now, in our grandest plan, you are a singularly unpredictable area. You play a dangerous game by investing your hope in others. Deception and failure are woven into the fabric of mortals. I can safely promise that they will disappoint you before long. Whether you heeded my wisdom or not, everything you've done to get this far has informed our view of mortal kind. I hope you're satisfied with your performance. We've learned much from each other. Was casting your lot with an undisciplined mob of pirates supposed to change my mind? Nothing could convince me that mortals are equipped to steward their future. Your efforts to prove me wrong or a difficult road lies ahead of me. Your alliances have made proving my argument an uphill battle. Well, Aethys will no doubt have a sunnier outlook on mortals and their chances of success. The rest of us will be sharpening our blades, preparing for the future he lays out for us. Aethys will take what remains of your soul. You keep falling asleep on me, I'm gonna have to start walking behind you with a pillow. Oh, by the way, uh, the storm's gone.
Also, I think if it seems we're all still here. If all your missions involve this many head wounds, then I volunteer to set the next one out. God's darnation! My head! Here's a sight I never thought I'd see. A trencher turning his back on his own people, too, in fact. All due respect, boss. Me being here has got nothing to do with the cause. I still believe, but there's more at stake. The Ranganui fed your family from his own table. Rawatai's finest warriors taught you to shoot. And this is how you use your gifts. What did it cost for you to sell out your homeland? I can't stop him. Neither can you. But I can give my country a chance at weathering what comes next. Roatians, defend Ukaizo! When the wheel has ground you all to dust, only I will remain. How about it? You were saying? Better get to it, Captain. The green boy isn't going to wait around for us.
insufferable. You descend into the ancient winding streets of Ukaizo. Battered by storms for thousands of years, the ruins bear the marks of their role as the lone witnesses of the gods' great secret at the center of the city. The houses and boulevards are pierced by great spears of luminous Audra. There are no ashen bodies, no birds, no sign or sound of any life. But with every step, the rhythmic pounding in the distance draws nearer. Soon, you can feel the vibration traveling up your spine. As you approach the center of the city, the weathered architecture gives way to more luminous Audra piercing the ruins, eventually overtaking them entirely. Cresting the top of a fallen tower, you finally get a clear view of Aethys. He stands, legs astride, next to a great stone monument ringed with eleven cavernous alcoves. All but three hold a gargantuan skeleton, bones scrubbed clean by the city's storms. An immense anguithin machine floats above the monument, suspended by invisible energy emanating from a well of light beneath it. Great brass rings spin around a core of metal and Audra at the machine's center. Periodically, Aethys's massive arms swing back. The movement alone is enough to draw great gusts of wind toward him. When they come down on the machine, the impacts are accompanied by eruptions of electricity, fire, and smoke. The hundreds of luminous Audra pillars across Ukaizo sympathetically dim in a rippling wave that spreads out from the machine. The only safe route to the god is a steep ascent along a monstrous pillar of luminous Audra, intertwined with fragments of Ukaizo's ruins that it has carried through the centuries. The pillar bends in a long arc, towering above the machine. The pillar levels out near Aethys's head, a silent observer to the destruction of the machine it has grown beside over thousands of years. You weave your way along a treacherous rain-slicked path up the pillar's skyward side. As you arrive at the top, you catch Aethys's attention. Fist pulled back, he pauses to observe you, with the same gentleness he showed at Ashen Ma. He lowers his arm and turns toward you. Strange to see Ukaizo in this way. It may be hard to picture, but this city was once full of life. The Hawana, yes but also kith from many other cultures. Great hanging trees shadowed these boulevards. Gardens sprawled across the open rooftops. Each spring, a festival procession would wind its way from the hillside into this valley. The celebrants would pass through a steep walk among the stalls of foreign merchants, flowers falling upon them from all sides. All people of all nations together in a celebration of new life. Such was the power and beauty of Lost Ukaizo. If we don't fix this mess you're about to cause, the whole world is gonna look this bad. I mean, it's a mighty heavy load you're putting on our shoulders. I just hope we can carry it. As long as there are people like you in this world, Adair, I truly do. This power has always been in the grasp of mortals. Now you will finally be aware of it. Now you will be able to decide what to do with it. Gone, please. I'm begging you. What do I do following this? How... How am I to best serve those still living? To improve our future chances of survival? The Deadfire and the Eastern Reach are full of Animancers. Women and men with brilliant minds who can solve this great problem. They will also need people with brilliant souls, like you, Shodi. People who can tend to the spiritual needs of the world in a time of fear and desperation. Remember, the flame you bear is not only light, but warmth. Provide comfort to all who need it. What right do you have to do this? 
destroy the wheel and leave us with nothing? Without even knowing what will come next? Aloth, we are all gods and mortals, responsible for our own action. But inaction carries its own moral responsibility. It is a burden I have carried for far too long. One must always do as their conscience dictates, even if that means abdicating a position of power. Rawatai gave everything they had to reach this place. In the end, they fell short of hitting the mark. Will we ever have another chance to prosper? Or was this damn island our last hope? Only you can answer that question, Maya. Rawatai has persevered through great adversity. The storms that ravaged your homeland have ended. But that in itself may present new challenges for your people. It is my hope that after I am gone, Rawatai will work together with its rivals to create a new world, instead of fighting over the ruins of the old. But what of you, Watcher? Why have you followed me? Have you come to bear witness to the breaking of the wheel? Mortals are already inspired. It is what has pushed them on for hundreds of generations to reach this point in time. Animancy is poised to go far beyond what we and Gwythans ever discovered. Why do you, why does Helia, think I should lend more power to mortals? It's true that even with all the advances in Animancy, the gods will enter into this era much more well-prepared than mortals. From where should mortals draw their inspiration? Very well, Watcher. I will ensure that mortals are inspired by my passing, that my power not be expended in vain. Indulge me in a moment's curiosity. There is something I wish to know about Aeora, about Kith, that I can only learn through your eyes. Yes. You followed me all this way, dodging an armada, navigating an impenetrable wall of storms, voyaging across uncharted seas with the machinations of gods echoing in your ears, all the while trusting in the institutions of Kith to get you this far and earning their trust in turn. Whatever else happens this day, that much is remarkable. I believe that mortals possess the strength to collaborate and shape a future of their own design. Not all of my brothers and sisters agree. By relying on others and coming together in a time of crisis, you illustrate my point. The gods will witness you and question their assumptions about how responsible, empathetic, and sophisticated mortals can be. What inspired your decision, Watcher? Did the choice echo your foundational beliefs? Or were you influenced by observation? Perhaps not. One day, I hope you are able to look beyond your misfortunes and behold a broader view of my motives. All I ever wanted for mortals was growth, transformation. Once, my brothers and sisters shared this goal. Some have forgotten themselves, giving in to fatalism or tyranny. Others have succumbed to apathy. It brings me great sorrow that crisis is the only way to set the future in motion. Would that I could pass the responsibility of heralding your darkest hour to another. Never forget that trust and coordination between mortals brought you to this place. Your future is built on a foundation of hope, and you have laid the first stone. Ask. You are entitled to any answer that is mine to give. For several reasons. 
My strength was diminished after the God Hammer Bomb, and assuming this form took incredible effort, with so many vying for control of the Deadfire, I also saw a ripe opportunity for mortals to cast aside their differences and stand together as one. They have never been more powerful, more capable. Because of this, the gods must justify their importance or be proven obsolete. The great work of the Ingwithans falls to ruin. Reincarnation as we know it will end. Souls which currently await new life in the beyond will be born into the world as normal, but their numbers will not replenish. Anything that dies will tarry in the void of the in-between, awaiting the motion of a wheel that no longer turns. Once the beyond has emptied, every birth will be hollow-born. Other maladies of the soul may follow and plague those who linger in life. Unless mortals work together to carve a new path, the essence of life will be trapped in the netherworld. Gods will starve. Aora will grow silent and cold. A generation or more. That much essence is already poised to flow into Aora. But unlike an hourglass, no amount of turning will compel the sand to reverse its course. Should you choose, you could lay down your burden and trust in your children's children to set matters right. That depends entirely on you. By your reckoning, there are still good years to come. By ours, time is short. When we tamed the cycle of reincarnation, we broke what had once functioned naturally and without intervention. The flow of essence will not normalize on its own. Essence will simply pool in the void of the in-between, never passing through Adra networks to the beyond. The dead will be left to wander in darkness, confusion, and sorrow. No one is worthy of unconditional trust. If you feel the gods are beyond forgiveness, then they don't deserve your obedience. Should you choose to accept the gods, I hope that you... I apologize, Watcher. There is nothing I can do to restore the glory of your hard-won and poorly situated... What happened to Cad Nua was not personal in nature. I would have occupied the statue even if it was buried beneath Defiance Bay. Given your perseverance, I know that a second home cannot be distant in your future. You have only to seek it out. Yes. They must work. If that task is beyond their skill, then they no longer deserve their position. I would have them justify their right to lead. That could mean swallowing their pride and hearkening to the wisdom of mortals. Some, I expect, will perform better than others. I must attend to my final work. You have carried a heavy burden across the dead fire, Watcher. Before I go, I would rid you of it. You are free now, as free as any of us can be. Many will come to you for help in the years ahead. Animancers, priests, even the gods themselves. I have great hope for you, but always remember that your future is for you to decide. Use your freedom well. Aethys squares himself to the machine. As you move to a safe distance, he draws his fist back and resumes his assault. The blows rain down with increased fervor, but the machine perseveres in spite of his efforts. Spreading his arms wide, Aethys draws power from the luminous Audra clustered around the valley. The energy courses through his body, limbs overflowing with intense light and waves of heat. He returns to his task, each strike bringing with it the sound of cracking stone and twisting metal, the flickering of luminous Audra across Ukaizo. As the ancient machine finally begins to succumb to his strength, so too does Aethys's body, built to withstand the passage of thousands of years. 
the great Audra statue has finally been pushed beyond its limits. Cracks appear along the hands, then race up the arms. Aethys does not slow his assault, but continues unabated. Its brass rings twisted. The machine spins erratically, but withstands the relentless barrage. Aethys stands astride it and pummels the base of the machine. Soul energy begins to flare out from the machine's heart, warping the air with the intense heat. Aethys drives his right fist into the machine's center, the core of metal and Audra. The god lets out a deafening shout, something between a cry of anguish and a roar of exultation. You see Aethys' arm shatter upward from his hand through his elbow. A flash of light and heat bursts from the core, accompanied by a cacophony of destruction. The moment passes as Aethys' shout echoes throughout the valley. Your eyes begin to recover. The god's work is accomplished. The great machine of Ukaizo has been destroyed. The wheel has been unmade. As Aethys' voice fades, the enormity of what you've accomplished sinks in. You have confronted a god. You have rediscovered the ancient city where the wheel was forged, and you have seen the wheel shattered. What comes next is uncertain, but already the legend spreads of the Watcher, who survived Andra's mortar and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Aethys. On your recommendation, Aethys disperses his essence and that of the thousands of souls within him to centers of knowledge and learning around the world. Animancers, engineers, wizards, and scholars of all stripes make astounding breakthroughs in understanding and harnessing the phenomena that govern Aora. While some of these developments prove beneficial to Kith, others are decidedly less so. But such is the price of innovation. What remains to be seen is how, indeed, whether they will restore the cycle Aethys has broken. After the battle, Aldi sends her fleet from Ukaizo. Her first and last act as Lady of the Ancient City is to reactivate the storms from Andra's spire. Her work done, she departs in the floating hangman. She determines that none shall control the power of Ukaizo. Under her, the Principe shall remain a lawless, rootless pirate band, and Deadfire shall remain free for any with the will to make their way in it. As the rise in piracy makes operations in Deadfire ever more costly, the Consuelo Mea Compressa votes to scale back the Valian Trading Company's presence. Luminous Audra and Animancy Research remain valuable enterprises, but the company can no longer afford to seek dominance in the region. The Royal Deadfire Company makes a final attempt to seize Ukaizo using an innovation of its own, a ship that submerges itself beneath the waves and storms. It is not, however, immune to the magically charged barrels that Aldi's ships drop into the water. After an embarrassing defeat, the Royal Deadfire Company consolidates its forces in the archipelago and limits its ambitions to a handful of well-guarded plantations. The storms of Rawatai rage on, and its people muddle through with the same tenacity that has served them for millennia. Demoralized by the loss of Ukaizo, the Juana tribes fragment further. All of Queen Onikaza's work to unify her people falls apart and foreign traders openly flout the decrees of the Kahanga crown. The mysterious deaths of Governor Clario and Storm Speaker Ikawa provoke hostilities between the Valian settlers and the Huawan residents. What starts with angry words escalates to retaliatory killings as each side blames the other. By the time anyone bothers to question the strange coincidences surrounding their deaths, including reports of a cloaked Omawi woman seen in both the port and the village, both sides have gone too far to turn back. As the conflict tears both the village and the town apart, many people, Juana and Valian alike, drift away in search of other opportunities. Many find themselves among the newly empowered Principi. After the violence they've already seen, piracy doesn't seem so bad. 
As the balance of power changes in Deadfire, so too does Nekataka transform. Pirates, smugglers, and other criminals flow into the city, openly flouting its laws. The Kahanga leadership takes responsibility for the welfare of the Raparu, and the gullet starts to improve. What was once a den of crime, poverty, and illness slowly becomes a quiet haven for the Raparu. The loss of Skiarilifus' essence weakens the Water Shaper's guilt. Their power wanes and their influence fades. The art of water shaping survives as an arcane curiosity. Your brief encounter with Letharn proves deeply influential for the children of the Dawn Stars. Plagued with nightmares and haunted by the deaths at Hesango, Letharn begins questioning his faith in Aethys. At first, his fellow Dawn Stars chide him. But that changes as word of Aethys' deeds at Ukaizo spreads. After all, what business have they worshipping a god who denied his own legitimacy? The faith of the children of the Dawn Stars fades, but their commitment to the people of Deadfire does not. They continue feeding, healing, and helping the neediest, just as they have for decades. It is no longer a holy mission, but it is a mission all the same. Ruanu, the chieftain of the Juana at Tikawara, dies mysteriously. The tribe finds his body washed up on the same beach where Anaharu challenged him to the trial of waves. Some blame Anaharu's vengeful spirit, others see it as Ngati's final judgment, and a few speak of a strange man seen lingering in the village. The leaderless tribe eventually scatters, some head to Nekataka, while others seek out the Wahaki. Ships continue to disappear at the southeastern fringe of the archipelago, and stories circulate of a colony of vampires and gulls preying on their crews. Though your adventures alter the destiny of Aora and the balance of power in Deadfire, they also leave a lasting mark on those who travel at your side. Your companions find themselves changed in ways both big and small. Adair returns to Hisango, where he reunites with Byrne, the son of his former lover, Elava. Although Byrne regrets not having joined the army of Aethys, he accepts that he tried to go about it the wrong way. Likewise, he comes to idolize his new uncle, who has truly marched in the lighted path. Together they set about bolstering Aethys' following in Deadfire, and prepare for the greater conflict Adair believes is soon to come. After you divest Shodi of her virtue, she does not take the breakup well. On several different nights, you have to turn her away when she tries to follow you into your captain's quarters. Shodi is not a priestess who understands the meaning of subtlety. As such, she makes her girlish crush on Adair painfully obvious from the moment she first sets eyes on the strapping fighter. Early in your travels, Adair appears discomforted by her persistent flirting. He often grimaces when she sidles up to him, and he takes endless pains to keep their conversations terse and to the point. But after a little smoothing on your part to nudge them in the right direction, Adair makes an effort to view Shodi with an open mind, and Shodi begins teasing the veteran fighter in a more companionable and less amorous manner. After saving each other's hides a couple times and sharing more than a few laughs, the two form an easy, and you suspect, lifelong friendship. Seemingly lit with an inner glow, Shodi takes to a new life of mission work with gusto. She still is committed to shepherding souls for God, but having realigned her goals with that of her fellow Dawn Stars, she now endeavors to help the living as much as the dead. As you travel the dead fire, you find her sleeping better and laughing more often. When the time comes for her to return to her temple in Nekataka, it's with a clear wistfulness and much lip biting on her part. She leaves you with her sickle and a hastily scrawled note. It reads, 
a keepsake from a path once walked. Remember me, Watcher, for I will forever dream of you. Aloth renews his commitment to destroying the Leaden Key. With the wheel broken, loosening the god's stranglehold on Kith is more urgent than ever. It is a lofty goal, and one he does not expect to finish in his lifetime. But if there's one thing he's learned from the Watcher, it's that a single person can change the world. Seraphin seems little impacted by your journey. Always knew the gods were larger than me, he tells you, on the evening he decides to part from your company. He's too long put aside those he cares most for. He confesses over a bottle of rum, and he's got leagues to sail to make it right. The following morning, he's gone leaving only a crude stick figure rendering of Aethys, scrawled into the hull to mark his passage. After reporting back to her superiors for the Watcher's actions against the Valian Trading Company, Palagina is rewarded with reassignment home to the Valian Republics. She spends the next several years as the head of the household guard for the Duke of Ancenze. In this role, she is often lauded for her courage and loyalty. Even with all of the praise, there's still times when she cannot help but feel she could have had more influence on what transpired in the Deadfire. Despite her good fortunes in the Deadfire, Halogena mourns the loss of Jackalow for years. She curses herself for not finding her friend sooner, for not protecting him from Captain Tutsaddle and his crew. On a few lonely nights, Halogena composes letters to the Watcher asking what more they could have done to save him. They are never sent. Time away from the Navy gives Maya Rua some perspective on how Rawatai conducted the Deadfire occupation. No sooner does she return to active duty than she voices her frustrations over some of the more underhanded tactics she witnessed and carried out in the name of the homeland. Her voice carries all the way to the Ranganui, who reminds his admirals that battles are won by superior tactics, but war is a battle of precedent, and winning is not always a victory. The people listen. Though Mayo's covert assignment in the Deadfire is considered a success, few claim knowledge of it or openly congratulate her. She receives no praise beyond knowing glances or the occasional raised tankard from her countrymen. She never responds. Though she has a lot on her mind, she still makes time to visit. Even if it's just to share a few pleasant words and a subtle wink. You don't often travel together, but it's clear that what you built in your time as shipmates is alive and well. She looks forward to seeing her brother again. So does Ashiza. The discovery of Ukaizo doesn't bring Takehu the answers that he sought, but this proves only a minor setback. Merely knowing that Ngati's Chosen landed on the island ignites something in the Huana tribes, a fervent desire to recover the past and let history illuminate the way forward. Takehu rides this momentum, leading by example and teaching his people to rely on each other instead of on omens. His message is an upheaval of norms, but it's as embraced and beloved as he is. Your farewell is short and cordial. Nothing further needs to be said, and you wish each other well. Takehu does not look back. The sea feels restless in his absence. Great changes are at work in Deadfire and the world beyond, but the storms of Andra's mortar rage on. Whatever salvation Kith achieve will be hard won, but it will be the deliverance of their own choosing. As the Watcher of Kadnua and the former Herald of Bereth, you return to your ship and begin the long journey home. You hope for calm weather. <laughs>